Okay, we are now recording. And this is the Valley Green Energy Working Group regular meeting. And we are discussing today um, the potential bid prices for um, our Valley Green Energy Community Choice Aggregation. These aren't the exact prices. These are just kind of a, an estimate of current pricing and the things that we would like our executives to consider when making the final decision tomorrow. Pricing is confidential because it's competitive. So um, we will be talking more sort of theoretically than about specific pricing. So um, with that, oh, Paul just joined us too. Um, I will explain where we are at right now with Paul, I'll let him know the situation. So Paul, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So um, you you and Marlena and Kim were accidentally invited to this meeting because oh. we were just going to discuss the um, recommendations for the executives. However, I think it might be helpful um, to have you all here just at least in the beginning, and then you all could leave and we could continue. But I think um, just given... Uh, you know, the explanation of the the meeting that we had the other day in terms of just understanding what was presented. Um, I will say that there was nothing said by any of the executives that raised concern that they would do anything that would be counter to what this group would want. Um, the questions I thought and Ben and Tom were there and can uh, either agree or disagree with me on this point, but I think the questions that they asked were similar to the questions that the group was asking in terms of pricing um, and options. And I think we're I think we're all very much on the same page. Um, so Paul, did you want to say anything about, you know, the the number of options or kind of our next steps? Um, I don't think I have too much to add to what you said, Stephanie. I mean the the meeting with the executives was Quite similar to the meeting we had, except that we were looking at actual price bids rather than like a representative bid that we had put together. And you know, I think the dis discussion was the same. And as, as Stephanie said, I think the thinking is the same. Now, you know, they're looking to use for your guide, you know, your advice and guidance. But I think they're they're in a similar spot. So, um, so just everyone, so that everyone is aware. The process that will happen tomorrow is um, we have a meeting scheduled at noon just before that meeting we will receive the final actual bids. So the prices that we looked at were sort of the bids at the time, but doesn't necessarily mean they'll be the exact bids that we get tomorrow. Um, and um, I think it's okay for me to say the number of bids that we received. I just want to make sure, Paul, that, okay. Sure, that's fine. Yeah. So we had um, five different companies presented bids. Pricing was very, very similar. Uh, one did not provide their bids yet, but they are working on it and they are very interested. And so we will get theirs tomorrow um, when we get the actual numbers. Um, and then the executives will make the final decision tomorrow in terms of who to go with. But um, Paul and Mass Power Choice will actually be making a recommendation. So, um, you know, I think that will weigh heavily as well. Um, but I, again, I don't think there was anything that we looked at in terms of, you know, the um, renewable option versus the class one Rex option. I think there was agreement that renewable could be problematic for the same reasons that you all brought up. So again, we'd be sticking probably with, you know, with the class one Rex. Um, I think again, 10% is around the, um, green content that we're looking at. So I think that's, you know, around the 10% mark is, uh, is similar to the pricing that we were looking at. Um, you know, obviously there is, it seems fairly significant difference between national grid pricing and Eversource pricing, but we will be still trying to stay just below the Eversource pricing. So that much I can, I can confidently say at this point. Tom or Ben, do you have anything you wanted to add without giving specifics? Excellent summary. Okay. Read. Okay. Um, Darcy, you have a question? Yeah. Um, will it be public at some point who the companies were who were bidding the, uh, other than the one that's chosen? Paul, I defer to you. Yeah. So, um, Typically, no. So we generally, um, communities try to keep that information 
confidential just because it you know it affects bidder behavior if they know who's who's bidding and who's who's not bidding and even the sense prices are even more sensitive but even who's bidding is it can be a little bit sensitive and how long are the contracts so there were three options that were um proposed a 12 month 24 month and 36 um Paul's recommendation is that we look to the 24 month options, 12 being a bit too short and 36 maybe be, being too long. Um, so 24 seems kind of like the the sweet spot, if you will. And I think that that was probably where, I mean, certainly where I was leaning as well in terms of recommendations. Andra? And do the bids um, vary depending on the length of the contract? They did. Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, because I I don't know what's coming tomorrow might be different. Yeah. So correct. Tomorrow might be doing so. They can vary and typically do vary depending on the light length of the contract. So based on suppliers' expectation, are prices going up or are they going down? Um, that that can make a difference. In this case, there really wasn't much difference in price based on the term, which is a little unusual, but there there was not. Adele? I'm wondering if National Grid and Eversource drop their prices significantly, if we might be in a situation where people start dropping out of the aggregation. And if so, if that happens, um, is there a minimum number um, for the aggregation to succeed? And um, can the price uh, be made more competitive? Thank you. Yeah, um, great questions there. So it's always certainly possible that basic service prices could drop and would could go below the program price. In fact, it's not uncommon that sometimes the basic service is higher and sometimes it's lower. Um, it's also possible it can get significantly lower. That has doesn't often happen, but can certainly theoretically possible and can happen. When that has happened, customers are, of course, always free to leave. Typically, not all that many have left in the communities that have experienced that, and partly, I think, because of inertia and partly because to the extent people think about it, they understand there are ups and downs and the you know, the municipal program is probably a good deal in the long term, but people are free to leave. The good news, though, is there's no minimum. So even if there were only one customer left, the supplier has to honor the contract and the price. So there's no that risk is all is all on them. Um, and then in terms of adjusting the price, the the one possible mechanism is you can do um, an extension to the contract and kind of negotiate a new price to the extension. So if you enter into a contract when prices are way up here and then they drop way down here, it's possible to agree to a lower price in return for extending the contract out. Sometimes that pro can produce a favorable result, sometimes not, but it would be an, it would be an option to consider if you were to find yourself in that situation. Thank you. Oh, oh go ahead, Ben. So uh, kind of trying to think about the implications of that if that is a typical or you know a, 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 a situation that's possible essentially where the ratchet could go down but not up wouldn't that make an argument for actually going for the 12 month uh contract because then you could extend it at a lower price if uh the utility, if the uh, if the utilities basic service goes goes down. Well, in if the contract were only twelve, what would what that would mean is you'd have to do a new procurement, you know, sometime within the next year, yeah. and lock in at whatever market prices were then. So if market prices went up, you would be contracting at the higher right. price, right. Um, and if they went down, at the lower. So that would be more. If it were a short contract, like twelve months, it would be more in the nature of just a new contract as opposed to an extension on the current one. But you'd be stuck with the market at the time. I see. So if so, the the, the ability to make to extend your contract, right? That this was all about extending the contract. If it's a twelve month, you can't extend it, but if it's a twenty four month, you can. Um, you I mean you always can extend if you want, 
typically you don't want to do that. You want to have a new procurement. So all the bidders get to propose prices. If you're extending, you're limited to the one entity you've contracted with. The one circumstance where you would want to consider an extension is in a circumstance where prices had dropped a lot. And so then the advantage of extending rather than a new contract is you can lower prices now before the end of the term of that first contract mm -hmm. in return for extending in return for extending it out. So it's a it's an option to consider. It isn't something we find you know, sometimes it makes sense more often than not it doesn't and it makes more sense just to ride out the high prices and then reset at the new price at the end of your contract term. It will get kind of um uh, situation specific so we would look at it you know in detail in the circumstances at the time yeah i did so just to still think this through the reason i that I, i'm curious about that is if if you got a 12-month contract and the utility uh the and the base price on the part of the utilities goes up you run the risk of when you renew that contract your price also goes up right but you're always going to be able, you should be able to get, basically get a price that's below the base price, whatever it is. Even if it goes up, it'll still be up less than Lumico's uh, base, uh, base, basic service price. Um, yes. Yeah, so typically, yes. Yeah, so that is that has been the experience. And so there is an aggregation program pricing strategy that only one aggregation uses, but that is a strategy of just resetting the price every six months when basic service set resets. They don't switch suppliers because there's a lot of administrative cost yeah. involved in that. But what they have is a long-term contract with an automate, automatic price reset every six months based on a number of factors, including basic service. As I said, there's only one aggregation that's done that. What their experience has been is that they're they're generally a little below basic service, not always a hundred percent because their reset isn't tied directly to basic service. It considers other market factors, but they stay pretty close. Mm -hmm. So it's a plus in that way. They haven't though gotten as much savings compared to basic service as other communities have because of this reset provision. So what that's meant for them is, you know, they stay pretty close to basic service, typically a little lower, not a lot lower. Okay. And for them, that's meant they haven't had a lot of room to add additional renewables either. So it's either savings or additional renewables. Okay. Much, much room for either has been the experience. I wouldn't encourage that now um, for the reasons we've discussed and also because for customers, one of the values of an aggregation is a longer term price, yeah. a price stability aspect. Right. And you do give that up for sure if you go with this um, mm -hmm. this pricing strategy. I also think in this case, with the fact that we're working with two different utilities, the national grid customers are going to fare pretty well. <laughs> so, oh, you know, yeah, um, certainly but much more than the Eversource customers. Right. And, uh, but I also care about the Eversource customers. <laughs> As do we. Um. <laughs> and, and so I, it, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to have like an idea shot down. I just wanted to see like, is there a way to ba basically avoid the downside risk of falling above the new base price while taking as much as advantage as possible of the potential to fall well below. Um, and uh, it, it may be that the happy medium of 24 months is basically your best bet. And then that, and then you're just, I mean, it's all risk. And I don't know that anybody knows how to predict energy markets. And that that's the fundamental problem. <laughs> yeah. That's just right. Yep. Adele? At one point, after tomorrow, will this information be public? Um, so that's a good question. So that, that'll be for the municipalities to decide. I mean, generally speaking, communities will do a big announcement, not right after the bid date, but closer to it because um, there's a better tie to customers then. So if, you know, it takes several months to get from today to get the program launched. So 
generally the publicity happens closer to launch. So you're not announcing something, but then people don't see it for another couple months. So that's the usual course. It's also possible though, to do, um, you know, a simple announcement just of the price now, if communities want to do that, or certainly possible to share with interested parties. It's not confidential. You know, there's no reason to keep it confidential anymore in terms of the bidder and the price. It's more becomes more of a matter of what's the best way to manage the communication with the public, given that it doesn't launch, takes a few months to launch it. Thank you. I, and one thing I will want to say about the communication about this once, because I know that the advocacy group LEA is kind of doing your thing as well. Um, I think the communities are trying to be very much on the same page with getting our announcements out and our community outreach. So we want to work carefully with you. We don't want it to be you all are kind of sort of out and running and we're you know, we really need to be, this needs to be a coordinated effort and we need to be working together. And so we would ask to respectfully, um, you know, check with the communities and our timing and we'll be meeting and communi communicating about this anyway, but I just want to put it out there and say it so that we're all clear and on the same page that we want to make sure that this is a very collaborative effort and the messaging that goes out is pretty similar. And in fact, Marlena is going to draft a press release for all three communities and will tell us when we can release it. So the information is going to go out pretty much at the same time. It's not like one community will go before the other. That's understood. Okay. Thank you. Dar Darcy? Um, as far as the, the uh, four questions that we talked about at the last meeting and the decision, you know, the recommendations we made and the you know, our executives, what they've decided as far as this bidding process, this will, whatever it is, will hold until the end of this particular contract. And then those things would be up for looking at again, I'm assuming. I'm, and I'm, for that, I, I, I'm interested in that question and also, as uh, you know, I know we didn't decide to go with the two mill thing, but I'm just wondering in the past, we thought that that had to be okayed by the DPU. And is it the case that now the rules are loosened up so that a community, a community can just decide to do that on its own? Correct. Yes. So it used to be right. The specific amount or the specific maximum amount had to be approved by the DPU and one, one mill is what we put in, in your plan. Those rules have now changed such that the community can decide how much to charge, you know, with the only requirement being that of course you use the money in an appropriate way. So it has to be used for the program and you have to report after the fact on how much you collected and how much you used it. But there's much more flexibility for municipalities now under rules very recently approved by the DPU, like approved last week. I think. So that's something that we could incorporate in a later contract. Absolutely. Okay. Um, any other questions while we have Paul, Marlena, and Kim here? So the only other um, thing that I wanted to report to the group too about our process with the executives is that Paul um, and team provided a summary on each of the companies that gave uh, bids or proposed bids. And so I think that was really helpful information because it was based on their experience and understanding of each of these companies with their various levels of expertise and also response time. And my question about response time was response to what? And Paul said that it had to do with um, sort of individual customer inquiries. So how quickly do these companies get back to individual customers, which as we can imagine can be quite a bit because there's so many customers. Um, so we have a sense of those that are much stronger and quicker at responding than others. So I, it was really, I thought that was extremely helpful information because just so you're aware when the executives are considering the pricing, they're also going to be looking at those recommendations as well. And ultimately, Paul will be making a recommendation um, 
you know, based on his experience and everything that we are looking for, um, which of course we have the utmost implicit trust in Paul and Marlena and Kim. So, um, so anyway, that's, I just wanted to share that information as well. So you were all know that that was, that information was available to us too. Andra? So um, I think I understand this correctly, that the supplier becomes the <clears throat> contact for, um, it, as, ra rather than um, Paul, Kim, and Marlena, in, in terms of managing the outreach, is that right? Um, so we, our firm remains the, the face of it. So for things like the opt-out notice, for example, the, the supplier is the one who mails it. So they physically print it out and they mail it, but they, you know, that's the text that the municipalities have been approved and we, we work with you on that. In terms of customer inquiries, we direct folks, all the program materials, direct them to call our office. And we have a team of people that take those questions. And we also manage a website where people can make requests to move up, you know, opt up or opt down, whatever they whatever they want to do. Um, and then we interact with the suppliers to get them to implement those changes. So if a customer, for example, wants to go from standard to opt up, what has to happen is the supplier has to send a notice to the utility that says change this customer's product and their price and get them more recs. And so that's the area where processing those in the first place. And then in particular, if there's ever any kind of a little snafu, which there often are, you know, the customer's account number was wrong or some other thing, um, supplier attentiveness or responsiveness to those matters can can vary. So that's one of the factors that that it's important to consider is how, you know, how, how good a job are they going to do with that? I see. But it is the supplier's name that will appear on the bills. Is that, that right? That's that's correct. And that's a requirement. It would be easier if it weren't, but the requirement is that their name is on the bill and their phone number. That's correct. And so they do get caught for that reason, they do get customer calls too directly to them. Just to be clear, the on bill text that's been submitted or that or that will be submitted to the utilities, we're hoping we'll have Valley Green Energy or some part of that in there along with the supplier name. Um, but the, the two utilities have different character count limitations. It's just, they're both very challenging to work with, but we always try to get at least a portion of the program name in on the same row as the supplier name. Might be a little bit abbreviated, but something in there. So that's TBD. We have to work with the supplier on that. But Well, that's, that's actually helpful to know because... I mean, essentially, all this is a signifier, right? So if we do a good job with branding, they, people will make that association themselves if they know what they're looking for. So, uh, yeah, getting a sense of what that text will actually be will help us with the branding, I would think. Any other questions for Paul, Marlena, or Kim while we have them? Okay, great. Well... Um, I'd like to thank the three of you so much for, for coming anyway. And um, I think it was really helpful to have you here. Uh, we're going to continue our meeting and just have our discussion. Um, but I think, you know, that was some really great clarify, clarifying information for us all. So thank you. And great. I will definitely be in touch tomorrow. And Paul, I forwarded your email to Paul. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So, all right. All right. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. So I have um, this, well, I think I was gonna maybe just show the schedule real quick and then I'll go back to the information that um, Paul presented to us the other day, the slideshow, and we can go through that again and you guys can tell you know your recommendations. So let me just start by sharing the schedule. So just give me one moment. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Is it big enough? Okay. If it's not, okay. If anyone needs a bigger, just let me know. Um, 
so we had discussed two potential uh, months for launch and recently Paul had reached out to me and he did a little bit of a back and forth about, well, maybe we want to shoot for October and we were going to try to get everything ready for an October lunch. Then on um, further communication with others, uh, I think with some of the companies and then some of the program dates that we have, we just decided, or he decided that really November is the the way we should go. Um, it's better for me personally, because the week of the public information session, if we did an October lunch would be October 12th and I'll be gone that week. So um, I'm sorry, August 12th. So I'll be gone that week. Um, anyway, so I think we are now pretty much just looking at this no these November dates. So where we are right now is tomorrow will be the um, final bids and we'll sign the supply contract. I think once we sign the contract and we have the price, um, just because I know you all are waiting, I think it would be fine for me to just simply send an email to you all without a big discussion. I'll just say, this is who signed and this is the price just to you all, but it won't be like a big public information campaign. I'm just going to let you all know because, um, and then we'll, and then we'll let you know about the, um, dates for the press release and all of that. But again, like, you know, they were saying it's easier to, you know, there'll be just a general press release about that, but in terms of like really sending out the information in earnest, it'll be a little bit later. So, um, so again, like, you know, the coming soon postcard, the opt-out notice, the public information, um, and the outreach will all happen uh, within August. So I think, you know, initial press release will probably go out before this August 14th date. You know, we'll, we'll make sure that there's something that goes out fairly soon-ish after we sign the contract, but then the sort of more robust press release with more specific information will be closer to around this August date is what I um, understood from Marlena. So our public information sessions, what's gonna happen is after we sign the contract, we will schedule a meeting with you all and we'll all just have you know, some of this stuff that we'll have to, you know, figure out like what dates do we want to have public information sessions and outreach and how do we want to do that? And that's something we can do as a group and we can decide like in each community, how we want to handle that. Or I would think that we'll maybe want to do at least in each community, one live session. And then we'll probably try to do um, a zoom session that includes everybody. Um, so we'll probably do something like that. That's kind of what I'm envisioning, but you all, everybody can weigh in and we can talk about that more later. Um, and then we have our opt-out deadline of September 23rd. So certainly we'll be doing everything we can um, to get that information out as clearly as possible to folks. And then our big date is November 1st. So um, so that's the, that's the, um, again, it's the tentative program launch schedule. I think may adjust based on whatever the supplier or communication with Mass Power Choice. But overall, I think these are kind of the dates that we're looking to right now. These first ones are not changing. They're very, obviously we've gotten through these two already, but this one tomorrow is very solid. Although I will say, just because Paul mentioned that um, if it turned out that the bids came in and none of them looked good and the executives were really dismayed by what was being shared in terms of pricing, we could potentially extend and schedule another bid further out. So that is an option. I mean, it's not likely to happen, but it was interesting um, that Paul said the date, the bids that we received were much, much closer to one another than what we normally would, re would receive. So Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, I think, um, you know, if the pricing that we that we got just as a an example uh, the other day holds, then the the pricing may be very very close. Adele, it strikes me now that um, in August 
when a lot of these communications are going to be happening, um, a lot of people are out of town. Are we worried about that? Well, it's going to be just a continuous ongoing, like we're not going to do something just that week and stop. We're going to be continuing all through. I mean, it says um, September 13th, but I, I, my feeling is we're just going to be, we're going to just keep going until the launch, the actual launch date. I mean, people do have to, you know, there is a deadline for when they opt out and by then people should be back, but we're going to be, there's going to be, a. I think we're going to be doing bombarding people with information about this program. So we're going to be inundating them with information. Andra? Is the opt-out deadline the same as the opt-up deadline? I don't. Uh, that's a good question. I don't think so. I, I got the sense that, and and maybe Ben or Tom, you can weigh in. My My understanding was that people could opt in or opt out like as the, once the program launches kind of at any time people can come in and that um and they can opt up i think it's just like for the initial program launch we we have a deadline but i think it sounded to me like if someone you know 3 months in wants to join they can that was my understanding and ben if tom if i got that wrong please jump in no, that, that that's right. I think the the difference was that you would end up waiting a month or waiting a billing cycle. Um, so you know, an additional billing cycle uh, before you were switching in or out or up or down. Um, so there's a delay involved with that, and that might be confusing to people. Um, given so on this exact same same subject, uh, given that um, that that we've got our opt out deadline or you're automatically opted in and then you get this cycle or, or two billing cycles basically before you can actually opt out if you wanted to um i'm at least more in uh concerned about the opt in deadline for those who have um uh alternate suppliers now um and particularly like our our plan for um uh public information sessions and so forth to try and reach them um that, that wasn't even a question it was just like a hey what are we going to do about them i don't really have any thoughts on that anybody yeah. else we've been talking about that um in the local energy advocates meetings about outreach just that we want to do whatever we can to reach people who are mm -hmm using third-party suppliers um, and get get to them as early as we can so that they would be able to opt in as early as possible. So that might include things like Gazette articles or um, um, Darcy's column in the bulletin, et cetera. Yeah, I think we should do what, you know, it would be really great. Um, I haven't, you know, been involved in anything recent, but um, also community access programming in our communities might be a great way to have a show on, mm -hmm. you know, have a show on these, um, on this topic. And, you know, maybe even have all three communities represented and um, we could even maybe invite Paul Gromer to, to be interviewed or something. So, mm -hmm. Uh, reaching out, you know, LEA, if you have folks who are connected in the communities to public access programming, maybe having, you know, them do shows in each of our communities would be great. Yeah. And, you know, those are, because that's something too that can be run, you know, once it's recorded, they can keep running it and playing it. So it can be run that whole, that whole um, outreach period. So, and we can link those on our websites too. Like that's a really nice, I really love when we can link to community access programming. That's a really great way to get the information out to people too. So um, any other thoughts about this timeline?
Okay, I'm gonna. It is a good question about the alternative suppliers. I, I know we talked about it. I know we talked about net metering and community solar, and Paul basically said it was seamless, but I I don't think we specifically addressed the uh, alternative supplier. So, unless unless you remember something, Stephanie. I don't. Um, what, what at least one other community has told us, and I, I can't remember if Paul s said the same thing, is that there's no way to figure out um, who has signed up already with an alternative supplier. And the only option, therefore, is to mail something to all residents <laughs> which is, of course, expensive, um, letting them know that um, alternative suppliers or uh, people who have already selected an alternative supplier are not eligible for the aggregation. So information will likely go out and like we'll probably have bill inserts about the program. That's kind of a given, a standard. Um, which will go out, you know, that's one way of reaching a very, very broad swath of the community. So that information I would think should definitely be part of it. And I would assume that it will be. And we'll make sure it is. Um, any other questions about, about this slide? Stephanie, I have uh, an obligation to the town of Pelham to get something on our website. They, they're eager to do it. So um, I'll need help with that. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't think anybody's been brave enough to write the first draft of what gets said next. Probably um, folks at Paragon could do it. But yeah, yeah, we're not going to. I think it's going to be Paragon. I think because there's also very specific like the way that this right. gets communicated out to the public is so right. specific that we, I think we need them to do that. We shouldn't. Good. And I think um, to your point, Tom, I think that's like what we were talking about with Marlena drafting the press release. Yep. So I think folks in Pelham will just have to maybe hang tight a little bit till we, till we get that official Oh, I wasn't Press, suggesting that I would do anything in advance of the group effort by any stretch. Yep. So, I mean, it might be just, you know, that we're, you know, things like, I mean, we could just maybe update our websites to say something like, you know, anticipated program launch November 1st, you know, just like with a big exclamation point, you know, to to at least indicate that that's when we expect the program to launch, but then all the other information will come sooner. But that's just a very generic, you know, way of letting people know when to expect it. The launch yeah, date anyway. Date I'm sure that, yeah, I'm sure that they have a plan for us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They've done this before, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just a little bit. So anybody else? I'm going to stop sharing this slide. Okay, and then let's see. Sorry, let me just uh, gonna move ahead on the slide for a bit. Okay, Oops. I'll share again. Okay, so um, again, we we talked about all of this with you know us as a group. And with um, with the executives as well, and I did say this in the meeting already, but I want to really be clear that I think there was no question that the um, you know we were definitely going to be leaning towards making sure that our you know our option is the 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 Rex you know one hundred percent green option through Rex, not renewables because of biomass and that like I said that came up with the executives too uh, why is this not advancing sorry there we go um, 
so again, you know, um, we were just looking at the different options, the different rates, uh, you know, obviously we're not including the local green at this point, but, you know, in our outreach, I know there was some concern from you all about making sure that we at least um, communicate that, that it will be, or we are looking to have this be an option in the future. So that's certainly something we can do. Um, again, I think what we saw from what we saw in the prices um, yesterday, if they're an indication of what we're going to get tomorrow, we're going to probably be around this 10% additional class Rex, class one Rex, um, this 10% threshold, just based on the numbers that we got. Um, that was like the closest we could get to staying below the utility basic service rate for Eversource. Of course, it would be much easier with National Grid. <laughs> we could do more, but we can't. So, um, and again, like our pricing, as we said, was very, it was very, um, very close. So I don't think I have anything more. Does anyone have any questions about this? Uh, okay, I think, and again, we looked at the um, the voluntary recs and the, the impact of pricing, and again, we were, um, you know, I don't think there was anything that was um, a red flag, should be a red flag to this group at all. Um, we did talk about this briefly, but not much because it's really not relevant for tomorrow's pricing for the local option. And I think that was it. So does anyone have any questions? I'm just going to stop sharing. Or do you want me to go back to a particular slide? Andra? Um, wasn't the local option mentioned as something that they could comment on or bid on or wasn't that a part of the it was yeah. it was they just and they sort of commented as like how we might do that and if you remember paul gave us oh, some yeah. feedback on those options and none of them were anything that we really wanted to act on at this time right and partly it was because we wanted what we were thinking is it might make more sense to collect an adder to sort of put aside for local development, you know, renewable development, um, even though we don't have a project sort of identified and like, but then we have to really explain that to the communities that that's what we're doing. Because there isn't, a, you know, there's nothing that's sort of presenting itself at the moment as somewhere we could, um, we could sort of look to for that renewable supply. So again, it was for time for investigation and more development of that particular to particular offering. I guess I'd be more comfortable if we included it saying that we are intending to offer it in the future, as opposed to saying may be offered in the future. Because I think that's been part of the plan all along. I think I think we we can say we intend. I think intend doesn't is not a full commitment either because I think we need to be able to identify where we can where, where this development is going to be and how we can yeah. develop this renewable option. So I think that was the reason why we were being a little bit more vague at this time anyway. We might be able to be more um, definitive maybe even in the next cycle. Any other comments, questions? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing then. So um, I think maybe by the end of the week, if not sooner, we'll get the email to you about um, the result of tomorrow's uh, bid pricing and the results and who gets the contract.
Amherst will be signing on behalf of all three communities, but all three communities are making the decision. Um, I don't know, I, personally, I, I know Tom, you said something about having us like make some kind of formal presentation as to our recommendations, but I, honestly, I don't know that that's necessary because I really feel like Ben, Tom and I are there to sort of ask questions and also Ben is making the decision on behalf of Northampton. So I think our group conversations and concerns have been well represented by the staff as we've been meeting with the executives. So, you know, I, I, I could see the point if maybe there was something that was a bit of a red flag and we needed to be clear, but I think we're, I think we're all on the same page. That's my feeling, Darcy. It would be nice if in the press release, we had um, a little comment from all three communities to really underline that it's a it's a really a group effort. Mm -hmm. And even though we have a lead, lead community, I think it would be nice, you know, to pull them all in. I think that's the whole point of doing the press release all at the same time. Right. Amherst is not, we are not in any way advocating that we are the voice of this. We, we haven't. When we've done press releases, it's always been, you know, for the most part about, about everybody being involved and how this is a group effort. And we've also included very much that community advocates have been part of this process all along. So I don't think that needs to be too big a concern. I think we're pretty clear about that. You know, we're in the, we're the lead community. Somebody has to be, it's like Valley bike, you know, and there's times where a community needs to step up to make things move forward. Otherwise it's going to get stalled. So that's what's happened with Valley bike where Northampton has taken the lead. In this case with the aggregation, it's Amherst taking the lead, but we are communicating. I don't think there's been anything hidden from anybody at any point. It's been a very um, transparent process. And I think we'll just continue. Uh, in that vein with, you know, working together and collaborating and communicating that it's a collaboration. Cool. And Stephanie, I don't know if I heard you correctly. I, I don't think I was uh, uh, advocating for any kind of presentation. I'm not sure what I might've said. Oh, <laughs> you just said something about a form, like a more formal letter. And, and I just, at this point, I, I don't, think anything that formal is really necessary. I think we're, you know, I think you and myself and Ben being, you know, able to be in the room. And I think we've, you know, we've asked questions and we've communicated about what this group has been pushing for and wanted. And I don't think that's been lost at all. And I, so I was just, I think you wanted something more in writing and I'm just saying, I don't know that that's necessary. I think we're covered. I definitely I, don't want something in writing. Okay. <laughs> <Not sure. laughs> okay. If it was this call, I was referring to just like a public information document that Paul and team would generate just so kind of fitting into what I think uh, Adele was suggesting about getting, you know, print media, social media, just ways to reach people. That, that's all I was saying. Not Nothing, uh, nothing beyond that. Well, and don't forget that we have our whole education and outreach plan. If you remember what we worked on, sure. there's a whole lot of outreach that, and we need to be looking at that. Like, uh, you know, what we do um, has to be that, you know, we have to be following the plan that we put forth to DPU. So everything that we said is what we need to do. And if you recall, that's why we were being so careful about who we listed, because if we list right. somebody, then we have to follow up with them. So that, and that's why, I mean, this is where, especially I think um, mass power choice is worth every single bit of whatever they get, <laughs> because they know this, they know what to do. They know how to interact with DPU. They know what language to use, and they're going to give us everything we need. And, you know, they're, you know, the fact that Marlene is drafting the press release for all of us is great, you know, because she'll make sure that it's, it's, it says what we need to. And I think it's a very robust plan. I mean, I'm feeling, I'm not worried. I think we're going to be doing a lot of meetings and information sessions and following up. I think it's going to be, I think what Paul said to me is like, it becomes a lot of little details is what's going to happen. And that's where staff is going to really need to be on top of things too. 
So any other questions, thoughts, concerns, rejoicing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow we'll rejoice. Yes, <laughs> there will be much rejoicing tomorrow. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll definitely send an email to this group. But again, just sort of a, um, you know, a not to be discussed or commented on just uh, like, here it is, so you know, and it will be announced, blah, blah, blah just very sort of specific and to the point, and I won't say more. But I want you to know. <laughs> I want you to know right away, too. So oh, good. Thank you, good. everyone. <laughs> so yeah. So other than that, I think um, after tomorrow, you'll get the email from me, and then we'll schedule something. I'll check in with Paul about timing. But you know, in terms of like, when should we convene this group to start, you know, then it is like, it's all the public outreach we have to start like planning when we're going to have them where we're going to have them and all of that so that will come very soon after so all right um thank, thank you. you all so much for everything and really exciting that this is happening <laughs> finally yeah, agreed thank you yes. all right <laughs> thanks everybody all, all right yeah, take care